Yes, uh, thanks Luigi and um, welcome everybody. So I'm going to talk and spend the next around 30 minutes, maybe a few more uh, talking just about recapping Qt6, what led us there, what motivated us to do Qt6, where we are with Qt6.1 and a little bit of an outlook into 2.6 into and slightly beyond. So let's get going. Um, to start with, when we're doing a major version update, it's always important that we think a bit about what's really uh, the important thing uh, in the tooling we're doing. What is the thing that's actually driving us? And, and for Qt, it has always been, and for all the 20 years or more than 20 years I've been working with Qt, it's been about making life easy for developers, uh, making development of applications, cross-platform applications, and then embedded devices fun and easy. Simplify that. That's that's the thing that has been driving us all along. And for Qt6, we wanted to take the next step there and do some more changes that further improve this. So let's have a little bit of a, into a look into Qt6 and what has been motivating us there, um, things that we've been doing. Um, but before we go there, um, let's take a little bit of a high level view. Um, for Qt6, we had a couple of high level goals and fixing certain architectural limitations that we have discovered over the years in Qt5. We wanted to improve performance in quite a few places. Um, a very important topic for us has been to, uh, to clean our house a little bit, get rid of uh, legacy APIs, old code, uh, things that we don't want to use or maintain anymore. We wanted to try to see what we can do with package man management support and, and have that better supported within Qt. I don't think we're quite there yet with Qt 6, but uh, it is still something that's on our agenda. Make the core product, the core of Qt, a bit smaller and more modular, um, maybe also allowing us to do uh, handle add-ons slightly in a different way. But then, of course, also very, very importantly that we are keeping the compatibility with Qt 5 as much as is possible. Um, we have also have a couple of important high-level values that we, we need to keep up, and that's our user's value. This is the cross-platform nature of Qt that we are basically running on all every desktop operating system out there, every mobile operating system, and a wide, wide variety of embedded systems. The maintainability, compatibility that Qt actually takes the burden of bringing your application to the next version of a platform away from you, that we're trying to take that, and that the code that you're writing is actually generically very maintainable over time. Scalability, you can go from very low-end embedded systems um, to high, complex high-end desktop applications, connected applications that sp span multiple devices, multiple uh, large systems like that. Um, the APIs and whatever we're having on the tooling side should be intuitive and easy to use. We're proud of the documentation that we're having and we want to keep it that way. Having a world-class documentation is really, really important. And the thing that got over the last years more and more important for us is also the tooling. So a couple of high-level goals, as I said, cleaning up our code base and our architecture and not new features. That was the main goal for Qt 6.0 and is still the main goal for 6.1 and 6.2. We want, we're not focusing that much on bringing tons of new features to you at this point in time, but rather clean up um, what we have and prepare it for the future. Nevertheless, you'll see some pretty cool stuff also already in 6.0 and more of that coming in 6.1 and 6.2. Compatibility, as I mentioned before, is really, really important from, for, for us. And we have a very large user base out there. KDE is one of the big projects that's using Qt, but we have so many other people. There are billions of lines of code that are written against Qt. And that means we need to make it easy to bring all that code over from Qt 5 to over to Qt 6. So, we wanted to make sure that Qt 6 is as source compatible as we can with Qt 5. There's still nevertheless some porting that will be required. And I think some of you who have been working on that already in, within KDE have maybe seen, seen a bit of that. Um, 
we have removed all the deprecated functionality that goes back to the house cleaning that we wanted to do and preparing ourselves to the, for the future, which means you'll have to clean up certain pieces, but most of that can be done on top of 515 enabling deprecation warnings um, will get you a long way there, way there. And those changes really prepare us for now for the next years to come so that we can hopefully also Qt6 can have a rather long lifetime. Let's have a little bit of a look at the large architectural changes we've been doing for Qt6. Um, the first one was to move over to C++17. Um, that has been an important topic for us. Um, we wanted to move along with the C++ standard and make sure that we can also use features that, newer features that are available in those new C++ versions. Um, we've moved to C++11 with Qt 5.6. Now was time, the time to take the next big step, step and also start using that in our code in our own code, but also modernizing some of our APIs to at least to some extent where possible to make use of modern C++ features. We've st let's start off at the low end, what we've been doing on our containers. Um, a large amount of work has gone into that area. Um, a big thing for us was to uh, look at QList and QVector, the two um, containers that were doing similar things. Um, there were some implementation issues with QList. Many of you might be aware of them. Um, and we've now looked, had a close look at those and in the end decided to bring those together to have one class uh, in Qt for, for doing list-like operations. Um, and QVector nowadays is an alias to QList. We've inter introduced 64-bit support um, for all of all the containers. So they're all using QSize type now to store size-related and index-related information, meaning you can have more than two, uh, two, uh, two billion items in, in the container, something that was requested for a very long time for many of our users. QHash and QMap got completely rewritten. QMap basically is um, now using standard um, um, map underneath um, behind the scenes and can actually be converted at uh, or moved to and from uh, a standard container. QHash, we have gone a different route and we implemented it on uh, completely on our own. I'll show you on the next slide a little bit why. And then we've went in and filled lots of API gaps that we used containers had towards the standard containers. Make sure we can consistently use move operations, m plays, ranges, and initializer lists, and other things. So with QHash, we actually went and back and did our own implementation. And here's a little bit of the reason why. We had a look at standard unordered map and whether that could be a solution to base ourselves on top of that. But what we found when we did some benchmarking and some measurements was that standard unordered map was performing rather similar to QHash and Qt5. It was a bit better in terms of memory usage and consumption, but there are other hash tables out there who can do a lot better. And we went in and looked at that and then implemented our a hash table that gives a very good uh, compromise um, or gives us very good performance also for large hash tables and a much, much lower memory consumption than what we had with QHash and Qt5. We were finished also another item that was only 80% done in Qt5, and that was this Unicode handling and, and all our string classes. In Qt6 now, all text handling is Unicode based. We assume basically UTF-8 for data that we're reading in by default and UTF-16 for all our internal uh, data that we're storing. Our source code, uh, for source code, we by default is also assume UTF-8 and we've cleaned up all our string related classes to make sure that we have now a consistent set where we added QUTF8 string view for UTF8 uh, encoded data and the view into UTF8 encoded data. We had QString view already and com uh, completed that one, made it, uh, made it uh, mirror the whole, all of the read only API of QString. 
and deprecated uh, certain APIs such as QStringRef. Finally, we also took the step and moved the legacy encoding support for out of Qt Core. So Qt Text Codec is not part of Qt Core anymore. We have a QString uh, converter classes that can do Unicode conversions plus Latin 1 and local 8-bit. A second big topic for us was the support of bindings. Um, bindings are a concept uh, that came and that we introduced in QML and Qt Quick. Uh, when we, and that is probably the feature that made uh, Qt Quick really, really successful over the last years. Having the ability to bind uh, arbitrary expressions to properties and making sure the properties get up automatically updated whenever a dependency, something in the expression changes, has proven to be extremely powerful. And with Qt6, we wanted to bring that support down to Qt6 to, uh, to make it available to all of Qt and bring it uh, to C++. So that when you're doing C++ development, you can use bindings the same way as you can use them in Qt Quick. I wanted to make sure that we have a seamless integration there with QObject um, and make it a, a simple extension of the existing property system. In addition, we also introduced a new QProperty class, which supports bindable properties also outside of QObject. Here's a simple example in Qt Quick. You can easily, if you define, for example, a rectangle, um, and it has a property width, height, and border, and you can easily bind here the width to the height. So when you change the width, the height will get adjusted. It's, a, it's actually a square with using those bindings, and it has a border that is 10% of the height and thus 10% of the width. And those relationships always hold. In Qt6, you can do that, the same thing um, in C++, and the code is rather similar. Um, so we have a, a rectangle as a struct with three properties, width, height, and border. And then you can set up in the constructor, you can set up your bindings um, where you bind the width to the, uh, the height to the width and the border to 10% of the height. The second really, really big change and new feature for us was, was redoing our graphics architecture. This is probably the one area in Qt where we've done more, a lot of work um, apart from Qt Core and, and the changes there. This is probably the area that has received most work there. And the reason for that is that the world has changed significantly since we introduced Qt 5 in this area. When we did Qt 5.0, OpenGL was the cross-platform API that you could use um, for 3D and hardware accelerated graphics. It was pretty much supported everywhere, even though it was to some extent a little bit of a second-class citizen on Windows. It was still supported there and, and you could get uh, open good OpenGL drivers on Windows. But the world has changed over the last couple of years. Apple introduced MapMetal as their 3D, new 3D graphics API has gone so far as to deprecate OpenGL. Um, Vulkan has come up by the Kronos Group as a successor, and Microsoft is focusing more and more of their work also on direct 3D. So it was time for us to change that and introduce something that helps um, take this away because now we have we're having a, a situation where there are lots of many different APIs and for us as a cross-platform framework of course the job is then to see how we can take that burden away from the application developer so we added what a thin layer on top of those graphics API called the Qt rendering hardware interface and built Qt Quick the scene graph um, Qt Quick 2D and 3D on top of that in addition, we introduced a new module called uh, Qt Shader Tools to be able to handle shaders in a cross-platform way. The rendering hardware interface um, is actually an abstraction a very thin abstraction layer for 3D graphics APIs, covering OpenGL, Metal, Direct3D, um, and Vulkan. And it abstracts um, multiple graphic all the graphical objects that we need materials meshes shaders and so on for the moment it's an internal api tuned towards the needs of Qt. um 
we are considering making parts of that public also in the long term, probably QPA style, um, so that we will not guarantee full compatibility between the minor acute versions. But there is certainly a need for users to also be able to integrate with the rendering hardware interface in the future. But for now, it's an internal API. Integrated in, integrates with our platform and the window system abstraction layers. And Qt Quick, Qt Quick 3D, um, with 6.2 also multimedia and other modules, also Qt 3D, are now fully ported to using that rendering hardware interface. Um, Qt Shader Tools is the complementing module that we need to be able to do that. It's there to support cross-platform shaders. Um, the sh shading languages differ, differ between the different um, graphics APIs between Metal, OpenGL, Vulkan, and Direct3D. But with Qt Shader Tools, you can write the shader once in a cross-platform um, GLSL or in, in a Vulkan-style GLSL. And then we can recompile it to all the graphics APIs, both at build time and also dynamically at runtime. What's important to remember here is that Qt6 now uses the native graphics API of each operating system. So whatever the graphics API is that your operating uses, we're using it by default. So we'll be using uh, Metal on macOS, Direct3D on Windows, um, OpenGL or Vulkan on Linux, and, uh, and so on. This is, this is really important and, and make sure that we can get the best possible support on all of those different, um, on all the different operating systems. Qt Quick 3D is a module that we introduced in Qt 5.14, 5.15 but it has received a lot of changes and a lot of good things uh, in Qt6. We're now basically working on one combined scene graph for both 2D and 3D in Qt Quick, which means you can very efficiently combine 2D and 3D in one, in one scene in, one, in your UI and embed them into each other. We've extended and, and improved the support, support for uh, PBR materials significantly and also made sure that we can easily import GLTF, where we support the full base spec and most of the common extensions. Quick 3D has also gained a lot of new features like a 3D particle system, where you can do really cool animated 3D effects, instance rendering in case you need millions of objects in your scene, and um, also things like mesh morphing animations are now supported. So you can, and you can easily connect that and hook that up in QML to the state changes of your user interface. Finally, um, we've been pushing for better theming and styling of the Qt Quick controls. Um, Qt Quick controls, as we had them in Qt 514, 515, um, were not really stylable. There was a little bit of uh, some theming support using PIX maps but they didn't use the native uh, style of the underlying operating system. That's something we fixed now with Qt6, and we have now native look and feel um, for Qt Quick Controls on macOS, Windows, and Linux. We're also planning on uh, extending that into the mobile platforms now moving forward. And here, the longer term goal for us is, of course, also to make sure that Qt Quick um, becomes something that you can fully use also on desktop and mobile if you want it, even if you want to do native looking user interfaces. So we will be working on extending also the feature set of Qt6 to cover those things. The reason here is also that Qt Quick is much more suited to modern um, fluid animated user interfaces than what we can do with Qt widgets. For everybody who has tried to implement animations within Qt Widgets knows that this is a rather difficult job to do. It's, it's, it's tedious, error-prone work. Qt Quick is, makes that a lot easier. And we want to make sure that all of our users can benefit from that also on desktop and the mobile platforms. We've reworked um, the pointer event handling, touch event, uh, mouse event, tablet events and unified those um, in with one common base class called QPointer event. 
the advantage here is that, uh, and it solves the problem that we had before when um, in certain complex controls and use cases, it was really, really difficult to get all the use cases working um, with different events there. Um, so for example, a touch enabled controls inside of Flickable, there were always quirks with that. And we can do that much better now with pointer events. In addition, we can also, we're also now tracking the input de device's history uh, of the event points, allowing you to be able to use that inf inf extended information in many use cases. As I mentioned before, another big topic for us is, of course, also the, the tooling around Qt, the developer experience. Qt Creator as the develop, main developer tools is something that we've uh, spent a lot of time improving on, uh, on improving. And the developer tooling, of course, fully supports Qt 6 nowadays. We have wizards for Qt 6 compliance projects. You can in inspect all the Qt quick types in the debugger. We know about the, the editor knows about the new QML and C++ language features. And of course, you also have inline access to the documentation and examples. We've done also a lot of work on improving the C++ support, the gen generic C++ support in Qt Creator um, with new and improved refactoring, refactoring tools. We moved the Clang code model up to Clang 11 and have a much tighter integration now of Clazy and Clang Tidy. And in, finally, did also lots of other smaller changes just to improve that experience. And finally, of course, uh, also in Qt Creator, vastly improved CMake support. We're having that there. Um, a lot of the improvements come through the work that we've been doing, bringing Qt over and porting Qt to use CMake as its native build system, improving this, uh, a lot of the CMake support for Qt also upstream in the CMake project and then also doing that integration into the tooling and Qt Creator. There's a second big tool uh, that, we're, that we're doing a lot of work on that's on the designer experiences, Qt Design Studio. Um, Qt Design Studio is a tool that's there to, to graphically create user interfaces um, and uh, do all the UI work in a graphical um, tool. We've done a lot of work there to improve that. So what, with, um, what one of the goals for us when we moved over to Qt 6 was to unify the design tooling. In Qt 5, we still had um, Qt 3D Studio as a separate tool for doing um, 3D UI design. It was also using a language that was different from QML. We've unified all of that. It's all built on top uh, around QML as the programming language and this one unified design tool with Qt 3D Studio. And you can now mix 2D and 3D content seamlessly there. Doing a lot of work to improve that further. Um, one of the goals for us is here with Design Studio is to improve the interoperability with Qt Creator. Qt Design Studio is in many ways Qt Creator. It's using the same uh, application shell around it. Um, it is basically just having diff somewhat different plugins uh, and the different selection of plugins and, and, and some changes to the UI compared to Qt Creator. So that's going to happen. We have still a bit, bit of work to do on that front. And we, of course, have a big goal of making sure that all our uh, UI features in Qt Quick and Qt Quick 3D are toolable. Now, also advanced things like particles, skeletal animations, and that we have a lot of uh, low-code features available there for, for the developers and designers so that you can visually program a lot of the UI logic. Things like shader programming tools, um, wireframe tools for 2D shapes and paths, all of those kind of things are things that we want to add to Qt Design Studio. Beyond Qt 6.1, what's happening there? What are we working on right now? Um, as you probably know, um, Qt 6.2 has just recently gone into feature freeze. And most of the work for, has been there focused around putting the remaining add-ons to Qt 6. Connectivity, remote objects. Um, it, with 6.1, we had already charts and data visualization, many others. All of those are coming back in 6.2. And uh, 6.2 should be to the largest extent feature complete in meaning having the same feature set as Qt 
there's a lot of bug fixing we have been doing and working on and making sure that we have uh, stability and maturity. Um, 6.2 will be the first long-term supported release for the com uh, on the commercial side as well. So we want to make sure it's as good as possible. And of course, also make sure that the development targets then again match what we had in Q5 by adding integrity, QNX, WebAssembly, and more embedded hardware platforms. A larger change that's happening with Qt6 is that we're getting a completely rewritten Qt Multimedia. I've been myself working a lot on, on that module with an easier to use API and hopefully a consistent cross-platform feature set. Qt Multimedia has been, let's say, um, a module that was that we were never really happy with during the Qt5 lifetime. And I think I hope that we can now with Qt6 get something that's really good and easy to use and that also our users will be happy with. Qt Web Engine will live a little bit more its own life uh, with uh, in Qt6. We will be working on decoupling it from the Qt release cycles, allowing it to do faster releases. Um, basically always base it on top of the latest, most secure Chromium and be able to use uh, that web, latest web engine version with, a mul uh, with multiple Qt versions. And of course, finally, also Qt for Python is something that we're bringing along all the way and where we want to support everything there. So here's the list of the supported modules that we had. As you can see, we already had quite a lot of things available in Qt 6.0. In 6.1, we added another um, seven, eight modules. And with 6.2, most of the remaining modules that, we're, uh, that we had in Qt5 are then available as well. As you see, Bluetooth, multimedia, NFC, remote objects, serial bus, you name it. On the platform side, um, in Qt6.1, we're basically supporting um, Windows 10, Mac OS 11 on Intel hardware and Linux as development hosts, and then have also Windows 10, Mac OS 10.14 and newer, Linux um, desktop and embedded um, uh, as target environments on the mobile side, Android um, and iOS. And then finally, we're, we're having on the embedded side, QNX and integrity as text previews. For 6.2, this is improving slightly and um, we're then also supporting um, Mac OS 11 on ARM uh, on Apple Silicon um, fully, both as a development host and the target environment. We're fully supporting then QNX and Integrity, and we're bringing WebAssembly back as well. Okay, and here finally, um, just to give you an overview over the release schedule, Qt 6.1 has been released in May. We're working on Qt 6.2 and hope to have it out in September this year. And then if you look closely, you can see that we're adjusting our release schedule slightly. Um, we're continuing to have a six uh, uh, biannual releases every six months, but we're shifting them forward a little bit. We used to have them in usually November, December, and May, just before Christmas and just before the summer vacation break. And we're now shifting that more towards spring and autumn with March and September. That is our long-term goal. Okay, and that brings me to the end of my presentation here. Thank you very much for listening, and I think I'm happy to answer as many questions as possible in the remaining 10 minutes. Thank you, Lars. Uh, there is a lot of work ongoing, and when you have to um, deal with a base library or base framework better like Qt, so it's always complicated when you have to do breaking changes. But we have a lot of questions, so let's start. <laughs> so from the Nicholas asks, uh, we need one to white codec support in KDE to handle arbitrary data from the internet. Any plans from for bringing that back in the future in some form? So. First of all, it's not completely gone. Um, the existing Qt text codec support is there in the Qt5 compat library. So you can still have that available. The plan for me for the longer term is, um, or the change was twofold actually. One of them was um, that I was never really happy with the Qt text codec API and QString converter, QString encoder, decoder has a much better API in that respect. Um, for the long term, I think that, uh, and 
I've designed QString encoder and decoder in a way that we can extend it um, and basically um, add a, a little bit of a plugin infrastructure there to it so that it can support other encodings as well. Um, probably uh, just using IC, ICU as a backend there and with the plugin would solve most of those issues. Hasn't happened yet for 6.2. Uh, it's a little bit on the backlog right now because it's not that urgent for, for most people. Um, there are very few applications that need the full codec support these days. Um, it's basically an, an email application. When you're doing that, there might be still a little bit the web browsers, but they're anyway doing their own stuff. And then it's maybe a text editor, and that's where it ends. So. Uh, it's sort okay. of a, a little bit that corner case use case these days. If you look at um, how how much of the uh, text and the data out there is you, Unicode encoded these days. Yeah, so compatibility sometimes is important. Um, so the, the the other another very voted question from David is: Would it be possible to create our our own new style, quick control style? For us, Fusion is not really native. Um, I understand that Fusion is not really native um, for KDE. Um, I think it's possible. I haven't actually looked into the architecture. Um, and I mean, uh, of course, we can certainly consider how to do that, whether you want to do that as a plugin in KDE or contributed upstream to Qt. Both of those are actually uh, should be possible. And if, if there's hindrances in the way, um, we can see what we can do to enable that. Um, Sean is also talking, I think, later on here. here, And um, ask him, I think he knows more, much more about uh, the system than I do. OK. Um, there are some questions. I, I'm going to combine three questions about modules which are not in the list. Uh, people are asking especially about Qt speech, Qt location, and about Qt gamepad, if there are plans for those three. Yes. Um, so Qt Gamepad, let's start with that one, um, is basically, I think it's, we just haven't published it. It does compile against Qt 6. So if you pull the code from Git, uh, from Code Review, or from Garrett, it just, um, it, as, as far as I know, it works against Qt 6. Um, not currently supported. We're not quite sure what to do about the module in the longer term. But it is there, the code's there, and it should work. Um, Qt Location is something that will come after 6.2, and we will be working on bringing that back. Um, and then the Qt Speech um, has always been a difficult uh, module for us as well. Um, text to speech and then speech recognition, we were never really happy with it. So we're not quite sure yet what we do, what we're going to do about it. But uh, any feedback in that area would certainly be welcome. And what people need, I, I would really like to hear what people want from the module, what they need. Okay. Um, I have another cute, quick controls question, but um, let's let's try it anyway. Uh, the, maybe it will be for the next speakers. But with, what do you define as native look and feel for cute, quick controls on Linux? Um, currently, we're using Fusion there, um, and the the question is, what is the native look and feel? Um, because um, yeah. KDE has been using the Qt uh, styling me mechanism to de define its own things. GNOME has been doing something else. It has always been a little bit of a mess, and um, that makes it a somewhat difficult. But as said, I I, I think uh, Sean might also be able to answer a bit better there what, yeah. what we can or can't do. So be ready for the next uh, talk, people. So, OK, the next question is, uh, on the graphics side, so Windows also supports Vulkan, and sometimes you get better performance by choosing one or the other. Uh, I guess DirectX is the other. Can you somehow manually choose which graphic, which graphics API is being used for a certain platform? Yes, yes you can. Uh, there's an environment variable you can set and to choose the platform. So you can do that just by setting an environment variable, and it'll use the one that you want. Of course, you'll have to be a bit careful if you yourself use certain graphics APIs directly then you have, have, make, have to make sure that those match. But other than that, you just do that. Uh, We have another short but technical question. So why Q size type instead of, instead of size T? Um, 
because uh, we've had a long discussion around that one and um, the problem is that we've always used signed integers for our indices um, in uh, in in all, all our containers also partially because sometimes you could use um, negative indices to in indicate that you're coming from the end um, now size itself of a container can only be positive i i agree but those index indices should be the same type and so we we had to choose a signed integer to keep compatibility it would have broken using a unsigned version would have broken a lot of existing code out there much much more than we we would have been able to than we wanted to the second argument was a bit that um also many people in outside the c uh, uh you know in the c wider c plus plus com community think that signed uh, is act actually the better type or would be the better type for for doing those things it just um, causes less trouble in many other areas okay and i guess the final question we're really almost out of time uh, it's the cute game part i was asking before there is um really the, the question is a bit more um uh, detail uh, is, is a bit more specialized than that so the question is, is really if cute game path support is done any plan for managing game path events in the future um as said we'll have to see what we do with cute game path first and how, how to handle that um there's certainly some work ongoing also because we are looking into into areas uh, like uh, you know with cute quick 3d how can we extend that with uh, vr support and those kind of things and then those kind kind of game controllers uh, fall in a bit more naturally also in, in terms of how um, things that you might want to use to control uh, control your user interface then. So we'll have to see, but uh, that's work that's ongoing. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the plans are, but that's probably after 6.3, something to look into. Okay, I don't see any other question, and in fact, the time is almost it's basically running out. So, uh, Lars, thanks a lot for this presentation. Thanks a lot for all the work going for Qt in Qt, and we will hear again about Qt in the next talks. But thanks yes. again. So, a bit round of virtual applause. Unfortunately, only virtual at this that, point for you. That's fine. Well, thank you very much for listening, everybody, and have a good remaining you know couple of hours of academy and a nice weekend everybody